name is Vijay Sarma, and I'm here with Daniel Liberty, and we're doing this for Toronto Truth Seekers, and we're also privileged to be speaking with Dr. Nick Begich. He's an expert on harp technology and a variety of other areas. Uh, Nick, if you don't mind, uh, would you explain uh, what harp, H-A-A-R-P, is, and a bit about your background? Sure. Harp is the uh, high-frequency active oral research project. It's based in Alaska, and it's essentially an array of antennas, 180 antennas in the array, that produce radio frequency energy for various um, weapons applications. Um, by way of background, I, I, I've always had an interest in science. Um, I have a, a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines. Um, come from a political background. My brother's currently a United States Senator. My father was a member of the United States Congress. Um, I was past president of the Alaska Federation of Teachers, Anchorage Council of Education in, in my home state of Alaska. Um, and essentially, You're bigger than Sarah Palin over there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing a lot of independent research. I've written uh, four books or published in nine languages, uh, primarily on uh, uh, electromagnetic field effects on human beings, uh, HARP, and, and related subjects. Fantastic. Now, we went into HARP very briefly there. It's 180 antennas uh, in northern Alaska that are broadcasting electromagnetic frequencies, uh, and this is a weapon system, a U.S. government weapon system of some sort. Can you expand on that a little bit? There's antennas out there, they're broadcasting sure. something. Are there practical applications? Why don't for people out there who go, HARP, what? Yeah, the, you know, essentially it began as um, a developmental prototype to, to prove up some concepts that were created by uh, Dr. Ben Eastland. And essentially the idea was, first of all, to understand more about communications, terrestrial communications. Um, the ideas that, that Dr. Eastland had within his patents dealt with wet weather modification, um, the effect on um, being able to create what's called earth penetrating tomography, which in plain language would be um, by analogy, like x-raying the earth, although x-rays aren't involved in this case, for looking for underground facilities, uh, oil and gas deposits, this kind of thing. Um, that was really the big interest from a military perspective, being able to locate underground facilities. This was right after the Gulf War, the first one in the early 90s. Um, in fact, the funding at that time was through non-proliferation and counter-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, what came out of our research was essentially the idea of weather modification, the idea of having biological effects, effects on human beings. That became very important um, in, in the basis of our research. Uh, the European Parliament uh, weighed in on this issue a, a number of years ago. They brought uh, myself and a number of other experts over to testify on the technology and subsequently passed resolutions opposing it. Uh, later, the Russian Duma uh, got involved in this um, the same issue. Uh, they were involved maybe even before we were in this type of research. The, the earliest transmitters, in fact, go back uh, to the Soviet era, um, where we then began to mirror their research. And we advanced um, substantially since then, Hart being the, the, the biggest advancement made for geophysical manipulation, the manipulation of the uh, systems that drive our planet. That's the root of Hart. It's like putting an instrument on the ground that's designed by man to act as sort of the tuner right. uh, for the earth itself. And that's where the, the issue gets extremely controversial and, and why we've stayed with us as long as we have. So imagine um, pumping energy into the ionosphere in one location and that the ionosphere perhaps for a thousand miles begin to modulate um, a signal back to the earth and act as a transmitter. Changes the character of the ionosphere from the direct current to an alternating current where it then acts as a broadcast antenna in the sky, producing a huge amount um, of, of, of energy and even capitalizing on the energy that's there and then sending that back to the Earth. And this was going to be used for what was called Earth penetrating tomography. In fact, this technology was proven up. I mean, there was a BBC uh, special, I think it was called Owning the um, Ionosphere. It was on a show called Horizons where one of the researchers talked about this where they were able to underground image, that signal coming back to the Earth would allow them uh, Earth penetrating tomography, underground imaging, which by analogy or comparison would be like x-raying the Earth or looking into the Earth, although x-rays are not involved. Um, but what would happen is they could penetrate the Earth, re return a signal back, and then determine exactly what was under there, whether it be um, oil and gas fields, certain types of uh, mineral stratas, or underground nuclear facilities and bases and so on, which this was right after the first Gulf War and it was our Senate that demanded that this particular application be the one that be um, that, that was looked at or no additional funding uh, would, would come forward for HARP. So in 1995-96, it was funded under non-proliferation and counter-proliferation in the U.S. defense budget where they proved that this concept would actually work. And we're speaking with Nick Begich, uh, expert on HARP technology and a, a number of other areas. Um, 
People who live near cell phone towers uh, sometimes report higher instances of cancer and so on. Are there any uh, people reporting ill effects that could be associated with HARP? The, the problem with that, and, and I've, I'm familiar with the cell phone issue, in fact, I, I wrote a, a peer-reviewed article in 1999 for Explore magazine uh, on that very topic. Um, but the, the problem with statistically getting a model out of the area where HARP is, the population density is way too small. And this is you know, one, of the, one of the difficulties. In order to get those kind of statistical analyses, you need a, a, a large and dense population and you need to be monitoring it over time. None of that is going on. What we lean into is the government research that we cite. Over 350 sources are cited in the book, Angels Don't Play This Harp. Most of them government and academic research that explain the mechanism, the underlying mechanism for how these biological effects occur. There's no question that they occur. The only question is at what frequencies is harp operating where those things can occur. Most of it is transparent. The body doesn't recognize those external signals, but very specific window frequencies affect human health and body. And our military has developed for instance, the Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook, which I just lectured a little bit about, where they actually look at the dosages and uh, levels and frequency ranges that affect the various organs and components of the body, from a, um, an elemental level to a cellular level to an organ level to the gross body. And these are the areas of primary research within the United States for development of the 20th century uh, weapon systems. So they now moved from this being an, an exploratory device to actually talking openly about targeting people with this technology. Well, with technology of a much different scale, of course, but the same principles apply. Uh, the effect of um, electromagnetic fields on the human body, especially in the ELF range, extremely low frequency range, can be done through a number of different technologies. HARP is just one of them. It's just the biggest one on the planet. Um, you can do the same thing with light, sound, um, oscillating magnetic fields, a number of different ways to carry the same effect. And with respect to this, uh, with respect to HARP, what, what, what has the reaction been of official bodies, of, of the Russian parliament? Uh, are, there, are there treaties, for example, I heard in the 1970s, there was a UN treaty that said even if we have weather modification technology, we shouldn't use this as a tool of warfare. Right. Have there been any discussions about limiting the use of HARP, and what exactly do we know are, that they're doing with it? We, we were um, responsible with, with a number of others for getting the European Parliament to pass a resolution that included um, objections to HARP for all of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, also, the Russian Duma passed resolution 2002 opposing HARP for the very same reasons, and, and they really have the root science because it goes back to original Soviet science. Um, so, yeah, that, that is happening. The U.S. Uh, continues to deny um, the effects, although if you read their own papers, um, it's right there. Uh, and it's pretty traditional uh, way that governments approach this. Coming from a political background, there's nothing new here in terms of how uh, military establishments address it. The fact is, um, the activists that are out there, those of us that actually take on these issues, um, we do make a difference. And the fact is, we're going to continue to take these issues on, other issues that are important to us, and it's something that, that all of us can do. You know, whether it's this issue or another issue, step into your own power, do something for yourself and your next generation, because we can. And the game isn't over until we're all checked out, and that's a long way from that. Fair enough. And with respect to this and electromagnetic radiation, uh, you mentioned your fluency when it comes to cell phone radiation and, 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 and explain the potential dangers of that. Of course, there's HARP technology. We're bathed in electromagnetic radiation all over the place, right. Wi-Fi radiation right. and so on. Um, what, are your, what are your tips out there for Joe and, and, and Jane Average who are going, well, I, this stuff is all over the place. Is there anything I can do to protect my electromagnetic well, field? The, the first thing is uh, don't succumb to fear, which is generally the first reaction. And, and when we bring up the issue of protection, it's, it's driven by fear. Um, I can tell you that that will exacerbate any of the problems that you're experiencing related to electromagnetic fields. There's not a lot that we can do immediately. I mean, there's some groups, there's um, a, a number of groups that are uh, talking about shielding technologies, things that you can do within your environment. Everyone underestimates what they can do. And what I can say is there's more power in this room than is necessary to change this planet. It only requires a little bit of effort, um, a little bit of trying. Um, I think I heard it in the, in the last presentation, you know, we fall down a little bit, but we always stand up when we're little kids, and as we get older, we forget to stand up again. It's time to remember to stand up again for the things that we believe are important, um, whether it's this issue or some other issue. But what I say to folks is, to gain your power back, do something. Recognize that you're part of a very unique group. You don't need to wait for it to form. You're already in it. 
It's called the human race. It's stepping into what we are as human beings, acting on what we know to be right and true, and making the effort. It's not about winning. It's not about losing. It's about trying. Uh, the, the simplest thing is, in terms of electromagnetic fields, is cut the power to your sleeping area. You know, I mean, most bedrooms are on separate circuits. Cut that power at night, not the light switch, but the circuit. Make sure you got a mechanical clock or a battery clock to wake you up. But if you take a measurement within your sleeping area, before you do it and after you do it with standard meters, you'll see the difference. So there's, there's things you can do, um, but being aware of it, number one, um, how you locate yourself next to transformers, um, cell towers, in terms of your residencies, those are all things that you can do. Um, the other is get involved. Uh, look up the literature, get that information to policymakers that don't have it, don't assume that they do. Um, continue to feed uh, your political leadership the information that you find as independent researchers about the effects of electromagnetic fields and maybe that will push the difference because ultimately these are political questions that have to be an answered within those environments. Are there any positive applications for HARP that you can think of or that people have come up with to say, look, we, this is taxpayer funded research, this is a project that we sort of essentially financed and supported, why don't we have it and use it for something positive? Well, I, I think there, there, there are, and um, in fact, one of the, one of the issues that was, was early on uh, raised by Eastland, the inventor, was the idea that you could create um, chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere, for instance, for replenishing ozone if that's truly a problem, or knocking out specific pollutants if they're truly a problem, methane as an example. You can create chemical reactions using radiochemistry um, that could solve some of these problems. I would suspect, and, and others have said, that it's those areas that the government will eventually turn to and say, oh, but we absolutely have to have it because of these things. Well, forgetting about uh, the detrimental effects. The balance is an informed public um, and, a, and a controlled and, and monitored system, and that we do not have at this point. I understand. Well, uh, that's a bit on HARP, and it's certainly a massive area, and it's a massive issue. Again, H-A-A-R-P, the High Auroral... <laughs> auroral? High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. And we have a lot of information <laughs> also on our website. It's free. It's earthpulse.com, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E.com. Take a look at it, take information from it, and pass it on to political leadership. Earthpulse.com. In, in the case of... Um, Weather modification and geophysical manipulation. I just want to read a quote. This came out, and, and we actually quoted in Earth Rising the Revolution, which is a book put together by James Roderick and I. And I'm going to read this quote. It's from uh, a DOD news briefing. Um, it's Secretary of Defense William Cohen when he was in that position. Um, it's, it's April 28, 1997. And what he said is, others are engaging even in an ecotype of terrorism whereby they can alter climate, set up earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. Um, now think about this from the standpoint of, first of all, what was the context of his presentation? The context was he had just delivered a lecture um, with Senator Luger and Nunn on um, weapons of mass destruction and international terrorism. Now this is a few years before um, our 9-11 our event. Um, in fact, this book was written in, in, before 9-11 to kind of say, hey, the next thing is coming. 9-11 <laughs> provided the context and what we've seen since a look at this uh, material, 650 sources are referenced here. Um, it has all come to pass. In fact, a lot of it um, comes out in press releases periodically. This was written in 2000, um, and we still see news clips where they're acting as if um, the stuff is new, and it really is. Much of this is quite, quite old. But think about it from the standpoint, first of all, accrediting terrorist states with the capability of doing this means the science has to be relatively simple. Um, and secondly, um, the idea that we can understand it meant that we had to develop our own science as well. In fact, we document that pretty thoroughly uh, in Gene Manning's in my book, Angels Don't Play This Hard, but the idea that a seat of sector defense would make that statement, I think is profound um, on its own. Uh, uh, anything else, uh, Nick, with, uh, that's on your mind? I know you're a very uh, wise and obviously well-spoken, learned man. What else can people out there kind of react to? You've been working on these. You're sort of coming from the activist, giant government conspiracy to do something or other that we should know about to Joe and Jane Average going, mm, I'm not sure what to do about this. So what else is on your mind to speak to the average people out there? Well, I, I think the, you know, what, what, what this topic has done, I think, for a lot of folks is, is raise the specter of, you know, what are these? 
you know, what is energy? What does it do to us? You know, how does it work? Um, in fact, tomorrow's lecture is going to be on mind effects. You know, what are the things that happen and what can you do to enhance human brain performance? That's where my research started with HARP. And, and really that's where it's gone back to, is, is my interest is in enhancing human performance, finding ways for us to utilize our gray matter more effectively, not just for activism, but for our daily lives. A lot of that is on our website. Um, I think the next change, the big change, the big evolution in humankind is we're, we are finding out how to engage more of the gray matter. Um, as we learn to do that, we're going to see an evolution and a revolution in the way we think. That's what we have to look forward to. Everyone is a part of it. We're in the best group we could also ever be in. We're in the human race. We just have to recognize and remember what we are and act on that. Absolutely. We have more information than ever and, and somehow in some ways less political control. And so thanks to Dr. Nick Begich and, uh, and his message, uh, which says, no fear, <laughs> hope, knowledge, power, power, knowledge, eh, chilling, doing something about it, make a and so on. So thank you very much, thank Nick. You for, thank you for the interview. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. <laughs>